important and then head right into sort of the uh, presentation by our community partners and our folks that are joining us in the room as well. And so before we begin any sort of uh, uh, engagement, we always should remember to acknowledge that whatever city or neighborhood that we are tuning into for this event, that we are all working and living on Indigenous land. And through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action, we've actually been gifted with a pathway to acknowledge the truths of the legacy of to uh, impact, uh, that continues to impact folks. Um, that continues to impact uh, uh, folks and Indigenous nations uh, throughout Canada as well. Um, also, through the Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action, uh, we've actually been gifted with the important actions that we can take uh, towards authentic reconciliation. And as we engage today, it's important to reflect on how we can meaningfully uh, work towards centering values of peace, of friendship, and of mutual respect with Indigenous nations um, in our lives professionally and personally as well. Uh, as well with all sort of community gatherings in a virtual event, it's important to set our guidelines for engagement, not only with ourselves, but also with each other. And so as this event is being held uh, through the Zoom platform, we at Arcto acknowledge and are mindful of the security concerns while using online platforms. And we strive to create spaces where accountability, respect and inclusion are integral. So as such, if there are any major or egregious disruptions that interrupt the host's ability to keep control of the Zoom platform, Jody Glee Mitchell or a member of the ArcDo team will immediately close the session and will be rescheduled. If there are any inappropriate verbal or written communications, individuals will be removed immediately by a member of the ArcDo team. So I would now like to invite the wonderful Allison Hill and her colleagues, uh, Terry Griffin and Yami Mosa, uh, who, to lead us through a discussion and some movement activities. Uh, Terry uh, is an educator and the principal of a K-12 parochial academy in Florida. She has served as an associate superintendent, academic dean at John Hopkins University as well. Her areas of interest include minority serving institutions with an emphasis on K-12 urban education, in-service pedagogical development, racism and diversity, fundraising and philanthropy and K through 12 educational leadership. Allison Hill is the curator of the Restore program as well as the founder of Hill Studio. And we also have Jan Mimosa, who is a movement-based practitioner who works at the intersections of gendered and racial violence based in Toronto. Uh, Yami weaves as ancestral teachings, decolonial practices, and movement to support connection to a space and place. Yami is a member of Brown Girls Yoga and Hill Restore Collective. In 2017, Yami founded Seeds Yoga for those affected by sexual harm. So without further ado, I'd like to pass it along uh, to Allison to begin our session for today. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm always appreciative when we come into spaces like this because there's plenty of other things you could have been doing today, and we really appreciate your time. And we hope that you leave here today full with information and knowledge. Today, we are going to start out the way we usually start out is I like to take a temperature of the room. So I want to know, just maybe in one word, how you're feeling about 2021 so far. We've got a hopeful. Okay, we have overwhelmed, uncertain, disappointed, frustrating. Okay. Needless to say, these are these are difficult conversations to have. And 
I'm assuming that if you're here, that you want to learn about this topic and maybe figure out how to incorporate allyship and the mindfulness around allyship into your daily life. So today, next slide, please. Uh, here are our speakers today. Uh, Terry Griffin is our, spe our first speaker and Yami Masoa is our second speaker. And our intention today, next slide please, is to examine two theories that come up often in allyship, color blindness and zones of reaction. So thank you for sharing with us how you are feeling right now. And we are going to, I'm going to hand it off to Terry Griffin and we're gonna get into our first theory around color blindness. Sorry, Terry, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, UFT, as well as Allison, for having me here today. As was mentioned earlier by Natasha, I live here in the United States. I am born and raised in Toronto, but now reside here in the United States. And I am passionate about people just getting along. But the question is, how can they get along? So as an educator, I work in, K, in a K through 12 settings. We have a lot of students, but I manage the teachers. And we always want to know how can people get along better and be effective in their practice. Now here in the United States, we've been talking a lot about race. And I'm almost certain that in Canada, specifically in Toronto, the conversation about race has been coming up. So for many of you, you're wondering, what can I do? How can I be an ally in this conversation? What can I do to move my conversation to action, meaningful action to those who are in my community or those that are outside of my community and I want to be able to invite them in? Let's go ahead and take a look at our slides. So we are gonna be talking about two things. We're gonna be talking about allyship, but I first want to introduce to you a term that has been um, that we've used before. It's called colorblind theory or colorblindness. But first, what I would like to do is that we're going to take a look at what is allyship. Now, I'm not able to see your screen or your your face, but can you share with me with a thumbs up or a high five whether you all are familiar with the term allyship? Now, there's no, um, there's no secrets here. The definition is on your screen. If you've seen it before, high five. If you've seen it before, thumbs up. If you've never seen it before, that's okay. Because by the time we finish our time together today, you would be more aware of what it means to be an ally. So how's it looking? Okay. We got a lot of thumbs up. We're looking good. Right. A lot of thumbs up. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a look. If we take a look at our screen, allyship is a supportive association with another person or group, specifically such associations with the members of a marginalized or mistreated group to which one does not belong. Now, I'm gonna let that sink in first for a moment because what we're talking about here is association um, relationship with marginalized groups. Now, as a person of color, this, um, it, it has been referred to as, okay, you know, understanding the marginalized black community or marginalized, you know, brown community. But what we're saying here is that when we're talking about allyship, we're talking about the state or condition of being an ally, being a supportive association with another person or group. Can anyone share with me what other groups have we identified in our society that would fit into the fit into the um, category of being marginalized or mistreated? You can type in the chat as well. Hi, Terry. Did you 
it seems that we're having a little bit of a, uh, um, a glitch in the chat, um, but some folks have uh, mentioned some words, including uh, indigenous groups and those communities, communities from the LGBTQ2S uh, community as well. Um, and so some folks have been popping in some words um, to myself because we're having some problems with the chat function. All right, that's yeah. fine. You all have identified perfectly the groups outside of just people of color that considered to be marginalized in our communities. You see these, um, you see these conversations in the news um, here in the United States. The Supreme Court has has explored a number of different cases wherein you have individuals who are marginalized, and they are feeling as though that they're marginalized, not just so much in their neighborhoods, but we're talking about being marginalized on the job, being marginalized at work, and for that reason, allyship becomes um, an important bridge you know, an extension to be able to let people know that I am, as an ally, I am anti-oppression, I am anti-racism, and I am for conversation that puts social justice at the center of our relationship so that I can stand beside you, I can stand behind you, but never in front of you as advocating for your needs, whatever your needs are. Let's go ahead to the next slide. All right, so here we're talking about the different ways of being an ally. And as I said, there's a lot that we can have more conversations and I'm, I would love to be able to come back and to dig in deeper. But if you're on your job, the question is, how can I be an ally? What I previously mentioned about not standing in front is because we wanna make sure that our privilege, right? Because we obviously have a privilege in being able to associate ourselves and to advocate for this group. We do not want to stand in front as to hide these people behind us. So when you think of the word allyship, you're thinking about a partnership. So let's go ahead and check out what we have here on our screen. So it says to be an ally is to take on the struggle as your own. Now, when we say take on the struggle as your own, we're not speaking, we're not speaking to like, um, be it mental anguish. But well, what we're saying is that we empathize with the marginalized group. And then in that understanding, we figure out ways as we could advocate for this community. The second one here, it says transfer the benefits of your privilege to those who lack it. I recently attended uh, an, an, an ally, an allyship conversation with uh, one of our teachers here. She's actually a former president, so she's a president emeritus, and she talked about me having privilege. And I thought to myself, I'm a marginalized person. How can I have privilege? But the thing about it with privilege is not necessarily the color of your skin, but marginalization can be associated with your color of your skin. But when we start talking about privilege, we're also talking about the things that you've been able to acquire that gives you an advantage over another group, right? Education can give you an advantage. Wealth can give you an advantage. So it's not just now the color of your skin. Your community, where you live, your zip code can give you a privilege. So when we talk about being able to transfer those benefits, we're saying, you know what? I have this. How can I extend this to my community? right? Graciously extended to the community. Amplify the voices of the oppressed before your own. Now, we've all been in a situation where we have a need. And when we have a need, we have a natural, this, in, in, this intrinsic need to advocate for ourselves. But have you considered advocating for groups, a marginalized group that has been unfortunately ignored or willfully suppressed? This is a perfect way to be an ally, to say, I'm going to put myself to the side and I'm going to advocate. I'm going to provide through my privilege opportunity. And that can happen through your voice. Now, some might say, you know what? I, I, I don't really want to talk about it. We can differentiate it. You can write something. You can communicate through song. But the idea is that you're amplifying your voice to be able to point out and to bring awareness to the oppressed individual or to the oppressed group. Now it says, acknowledge that even though you feel pain, the conversation is about you. 
I'm going to pause here for a second because as we are um, going through this pandemic, and I know in the United States, um, we are experiencing the pandemic differently. We still have deaths, but how we're interacting with the pandemic seems to be very different to what's going on there in Canada. But the thing about it is, is that when we're all experiencing pain, sometimes it's difficult for us to be able to look outside of our pain and under, understand that as a result of our privilege, we may not be experiencing as much pain as another group. So for that reason, we are now taking a look at being able to understand our pain, see how our privilege helps us in not bearing too much of that pain, but then seeing how our privilege can support someone who is in great pain as a result of being marginalized. For example, here in the United States, and it's likely there in Canada too, we have a disproportionate amount of African Americans who have been severely affected by loss of job as well as, as, well as COVID-19, right? The individuals who have been able to advocate and to talk about there needs to be greater awareness, there needs to be a stimulus package, there needs to be support for these communities. We're talking about people who are operating as an ally in their local legislator, they're operating as an ally in their universities and here in K-12, one of the things that we did is even though we were all experiencing the trauma of going through a pandemic, the institution that I'm a part of, they receive uh, somewhere between $250,000 to be able to supply iPads for every single student there in the school. And we do have a relatively large, uh, we would say marginalized community. So again, even though there's pain, being able to start the conversation and to use your resources to help. Now, this one, standing up, even though you're scared. Now, this is something that does require um, um, uh, kind of like these mental activities to say, you know, these affirmations. So this is something that I can do. I can advocate for those in my community. I can be an ally. And as I said, it is necessary to have courage to talk about being an ally, specifically because this group is marginalized. And we that this is term that we refer to as critical race theory that identifies that there are laws and policies that are in place that are that almost like deliberately or intentionally place marginalized groups at a disadvantage. So Sometimes it may seem as though, or you may feel as though that, am I breaking the law here? But the thing about it is, is that you have to stand up. This is something that you believe in. And what you're asking is that the, this group be heard and treated fairly. Now, the last one here that I want to touch on, it says here, own your mistakes and decenter yourself. Own your mistakes and decenter yourself. Oftentimes when we have conversations that deal with marginalized groups, we can make it about ourselves. And the problem about making it about ourselves is that I like to give the example of you're wearing boots because of your privilege and the individuals who are marginalized, they're wearing sandals. They are exposed, their toes are exposed. And when you have your privilege, when you have opportunities, um, sometimes they, they are not earned, they're just given to you because of your, uh, of your different opportunities. You can find yourself stepping on people's toes. Now I can, we can all agree, stepping on people's toes is uncomfortable, but when you're stepping on toes, at times, you can lose your audience. And when you lose that audience, this group remains unheard, but then you're somewhat confused yourself, like, what did I do wrong? When we start talking about allyship, it's about the group that you're associating yourself with. That's what it's all about. You have a role to play, and that is using your privilege, using your understanding of the community, helping them understand the language and saying, I am going to be partnering with you. What is your voice? Their voice becomes your voice. And in partnership, you guys carry on the work of being sure that their voice is being heard. And that's a collective voice. Let's go to the next slide. Sister, have you ever heard of the phrase, I don't see color? Now, I, I, I want to be able to see here, thumbs up, high five, I don't see color. 
Now, I don't know if this is a phrase that's commonly used in Canada. And I, to be honest, when I was growing up, I don't remember hearing this phrase. So I'm interested to see if Canada, which we identify as being more of a salad bowl instead of a melting pot, whether you all have heard this phrase before. So can, can one of my attendants, assistants help me with this? What yeah, let's put this in chat box. Has anybody heard this term before? Let us know in the chat box here. So we're getting some definite yes, yes some yups. Yes, yes, too many times. You could also share maybe a little bit of context of how you've heard it. Mm -hmm. Getting a lot yes. of yes. Yes, it's someone, someone with some courage. Do you mind sharing your personal story? We would love to be able to hear your personal story to help the rest of us understand what, when you hear, I don't see color, what does that mean? How does it make you feel? Anyone? Yes, in previous EDI lectures, okay? All right. Somebody mm -hmm. asked here, is that, is that, is this colorblind? I think you're gonna get to that soon. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, let's go ahead and dig into what we are talking about when we, when we refer to the whole idea of colorblind. Let's go to the next slide. Thank you so much for sharing. So when we talk about colorblind theory, we're talking, it refers to racial, racial neutrality, racial neutrality. According to this view, the color of one's skin does not matter because we live in a post-racial society. That is a society that has moved beyond race. Therefore, I mean, for, further, the theory urges that humans need to look beyond the color of someone's skin because treating people equally and ignoring their race will lead to more equal society. Now, I don't see everyone's faces, but the faces that I do see, even the names, they all tell a story, right? We all have a story behind our eyes. We all have a story with, with our cheekbones. We all have a story with the way we dress. We all have a story with the color of our skin. And so when we start talking about colorblind theory, while there is conversation about, well, this is not towards other groups, the colorblind theory works in that we're saying, I don't see you. And because I don't see you, I just wanna see the person. Right? But the question is, can you disassociate the person with their experience? Anyone? It's hard to. So when you see me, you see an African American, African Canadian person. When I see someone else, I see someone who is of East Indian descent. I see someone who is of West Indian descent. And with that comes this great context that helps me to understand who they are. Let's go ahead to the next slide. So I wanna share here that with most minorities, however, when they encounter difficulties that are related to their race and they have to interact with, and let's just say in this context, we are all educators, right? Or we interact in an academic space. And more times than not, we are, we have a passion for the content that we're teaching. And when we, when we see our roster, we don't necessarily see the color, but sometimes the names give us an indication that they're not all um, Caucasian, correct? But when, we're, when we start talking about and taking a look at the colorblind theory in your classroom or in your lectures or in the interactions that you're having, having with individuals in the space, we come to understand that you cannot be an effective ally if you're not identifying who that person is. The color of your skin, the group that you associate with, your history, your context, is your voice. And in order for you to be a good ally, you just can't stand beside the person and stand behind the person. You have to understand their voice and their voice is their story. That's the reason why colorblind theory is often brought up when we start talking about allyship 
primarily because when someone says, I don't see color, the truth of the matter is they don't see you and they don't see you in your fullness. They don't see what drives you. They don't see why you are being marginalized in the space. So for those who reference that they have experienced something like this before, or they're not certain, specifically, this is how colorblind theory works. I don't see who you are. I see your eyes. I don't see color. I want to make sure that I'm teaching you this context. But the thing about it is that you cannot teach me, you cannot associate yourself with me authentically without knowing who I am. So when we start talking about being an ally, we are talking about understanding the difficulties and the, the structures that put these that these groups at a disadvantage and being able to speak intelligently and have empathy for where these people are coming from. Let's go ahead. Getting some good comments here as we go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. uh, we're getting some good comments here in our chat box. Uh, one of them says, is the All Lives Matter movement, All Lives Matter, argues that we should be colorblind. And this is dismissing. We also have one that says this is very powerful. Uh, not seeing color means not appreciating the differences. We need to see color to understand differences. Yes, yes, very much. I want to touch on a moment for um, the, the, the phrase, all lives matter. And I think we can all agree that all lives do matter. But I'm not certain if the Black Lives Matter movement is, um, has taken presence as it has here in the United States. But OK, thank you. Thank you, Yanni. The thing about it is with the Black Lives Matter movement, and when we start identifying different groups that are at a disadvantage, what we are saying is this. At this moment, we want to identify with the group that is at the highest in marginalization. You understand? So specifically, when we start talking about the Black Lives Matter movement here in the United States, the data is there. We are watching it on the news. African American people are disproportionately affected. If it's negative, it's happening. And for that reason, those who are not people of color, they have associated themselves with the Black Lives Movement to be able to advocate and to present the, the, the data and the science and the images, the arts, the literature around Blackness and why it matters. And the thing about it is, is that we understand that all lives matter. And it doesn't take away from you. It doesn't take away from me. But in, in, in times, in certain times in our history, we have identified that some groups are just at a disadvantage. And for that reason, allyship comes into place and says, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to partner with you. Another thing here in the United States, we talk about affirmative action. Affirmative action is a, uh, it, it is a, uh, um, it is a, uh, I guess you could say a law here that allows for people of color, um, people who are marginalized, so are marginalized, and women are also a marginalized groups to be able to have those opportunities. So as we start talking about how can I be an ally, we're talking about association. We're talking about being able to stand beside and to stand behind. And as a result of our privilege, we're not at a disadvantage. Right. So when we start talking about allyship and you might think to yourself, well, you know, I am a marginalized group. The question is, do you have privilege? And if you have privilege, there is present an opportunity to come alongside a marginalized group and being able to use your voice, your talent and even your presence to support them. So I believe that my time is almost up. But before I go, slide into our discussion question. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Because I, and I do even see a question here uh, that may be worth uh, discussing here. But let's let's start with this: Where and how can I implement this theory? In where and how can you implement this theory into your allyship practice? And for and while you think about that, I'm just going to ask Terry and Yami 
both what, how would you approach a question like this? How do you support someone as an ally when you are disagreeing with them? Hmm. Well, I said, I want to control my ratio here. I've been talking a whole lot. I'm going to go ahead and give it to Yami and then I will, um, I, I will take second. You have any suggestions, Yami? So I think what's important about principles of allyship is that you don't necessarily always have to agree with the modalities that an individual um, or a group uses uh, to be able to show up in allyship. So an example of this is this past summer um, with the death here of Regis um, in Toronto, um, as well as um, George Floyd in the US. A number of folks, you know, said, well, I don't, I believe Black Lives Matter, but I just don't believe in the ways in which people protest. And so I think that it's important to note that everyone has a different way of showing up as an ally. We all have different roles. Some folks are going to be uh, protesting in the street. Some folks are going to be part of conversations like these in, within academic institutions. Um, some folks are gonna show up as allies by bringing uh, their black community members and friends food. Some folks are going to purchase yoga sessions at Restore for their black you know, colleagues. And so I think what's important is that when we're looking at the structural pieces of what's happening around allyship, it's important to embrace complexity and duplicity of the different ways that uh, groups show up around allyship. All are valid, all are necessary, and we don't always have to agree. But what we can agree on, as Terry talked about, is systemic oppression, right? So it's more than just the interpersonal, it's also the ways systems of oppression operate in institutions such as academic, media, um, politically, et cetera. Um, so we can all agree that anti-Blackness, anti-Indigeneity, homophobia, transphobia, queerphobia, gendered issues are permeated within those systems. And different folks are gonna take different approaches. So find the approach that works for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, very good. Um, I don't even know if I can like say anything. Yeah, perfect. Answer. <laughs> I will say that uh, when we start talking about like the, the, a phrase that's commonly used is systemic racism, but systemic marginalization is, um, is, is evident. It's evident in our workplaces, specifically someone who is in, um, who's both in higher ed as well as in K-12. We see it often, we, we can see it sometime in our classroom. So the question is, how can I, Terry Griffin, implement this theory into my practice? I have privilege, I have education. And not only do I have education, I have position of power. And power and authority is a form of privilege that sometimes we ignore. So what I have to do is that when opportunities come up in the way of employment, right? Being able to say, looking at these names and saying, okay, have we considered, right? Um, have we considered this candidate? or that candidate, not so much of the color of their skin, but saying that we want to be able to have variety. As I take a look at this image, I want it to be a kaleidoscope of, 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 of color, right? Are they present here? I want it to be a kaleidoscope of ideas and beliefs and, and even lifestyles. So there's an opportunity for me to be able to advocate for different people. I would say specifically in the classroom, being able to say, are all the students here being, are, are, are they getting the same opportunities? Am I making sure that the, um, that um, what, what, what they need is accessible, you know, to them, be it by my practice, be it what the um, institution is able to offer. But most importantly, in order for you to be a, a good ally, you have to be present. You have to be present and you have to be aware of and start looking at the people around you, taking a look at what you're reading on paper and looking deeper. And it will reveal to you where there is an opportunity for you to be an ally. And sometimes as an ally, 
you're not going to be the person out there on the front. But I know for myself, there were allies behind the scenes that work to ensure that I can have the opportunity. And now as an educator, I work to make sure behind the scenes that our groups, our marginalized groups, our people of color can have what they need in order to succeed. And that's what we call um, um, equity. Beautiful. Let's slide over to Yami. I'm on mute. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Allison. Uh, next slide. I see that there's a question in the chat and maybe we can parking lot that. Um, yes, yeah. I've made a note of it. Wonderful. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yami. I'm currently located in Toronto within the District One Spoon um, Wampum Belt. Um, and I think it's important when we talk about becoming anti-racist or frameworks of allyship, solidarity, because I know that sometimes folks don't necessarily identify as or want to identify as an ally, uh, but use other language like accomplices um, or co-conspirators. Um, and so in, in, the, in the vein of talking about becoming anti-racist, there's a lot of components um, as Terry so eloquently put, that uh, need to be taken into consideration. And so what I'm hoping to offer you today is uh, an embodied practice of really analyzing not only the intellectual elements of what it means to show up in solidarity, but also the heart elements, the body elements, and really recognizing this practice of becoming anti-racist, practices of, of solidarity require us to tune in also with what's happening with ourselves. Many a time when we talk about solidarity or allyship, it brings up emotions. And so we, we will be moving through an exercise called Lean Back and Lean In, which is a simple tool that you can use when you find yourself uh, feeling activated. Next slide. So this slide here, many folks may be familiar with it. Um, in terms of the zones of learning, right? And I'm also gonna talk a bit about the compass of reactions. But before I do, I wanna make note that this can be applied to so many other equity seeking groups. And so when we're thinking about becoming anti-racist, when we're thinking about um, embodying practices where we recognize homophobia, transphobia, ableism, um, disability uh, within our communities, it's really important, right, as we're learning and on learning journeys and unlearning journeys to recognize where we find ourselves on the continuum of the zones of learning. And this requires us to slow down and tune in and the number one tool I will invite folks to lean into is their breath. So taking three collective deep breaths, and maybe you want to join me in doing that in this moment. You can close your eyes, maintain a soft gaze, or have your eyes completely open. So that act of breathing is bringing us into the current moment, right? The act of noticing our breath. To say, am I in my fear zone when I'm talking about racism or other forms of oppression? Am I denying that racism is a problem? How is that showing up in my body? My avoiding hard questions, questions about internal, internal realities at the University of Toronto um, just so folks know, I have worked in post-secondary, so do you have a sense of, of um, what institutions look like around, um, yeah, just organizationally and whatnot. Um, but am I avoiding hard questions and realities that show up in my workplace when I see a microaggression occur with a colleague, right? Or when we're silent and we know that something similar to this past summer happened and we don't talk about it at all because we're so afraid. And the reality is part of being in solidarity is actually making mistakes. I always like to say it's about how we can fail better. 
And so in order to fail better, it really requires us to be in our growth and in our learning zone where we're sitting with the discomfort because when folks experience oppression or harm, in many ways, it is uncomfortable. It's meant to be uncomfortable, right? And so when we are learning and unlearning, there may be an air of, oh my gosh, I never knew that was your reality. Or, oh my gosh, the world is going to hell, right? Excuse my language. Um, and real feelings of despair as we saw this past summer. And actually, as we've seen for beyond this past summer, and so when we find ourselves in the learning zone, we are saying, how can I be vulnerable about my own biases? How can I recognize my reactions and not let mistakes deter me from doing better? So I'm not gonna go through every single example um, on this chart, but really wanna offer you to think of when you hear allyship, when you hear um, you know, uh, showing up in solidarity, where do you find yourself? How do you fluctuate between the different zones of learning? And that awareness is super key to how you show up to as an ally. Next slide. Another important um, aspect is the compass of reactions. And so in using the lean back and lean in method, what we're saying is when, for example, somebody calls you in and says, hey, I think what you did was racist, or I, I think what you did was problematic. Where do you find yourself? Do you find yourself in the attack other where you're like, you're wrong, I'm not racist, I'm a good person, I have racialized people in my family, I myself are racialized, right? Or are you in the withdraw zone where you completely remove your emotions from it and potentially dissociate and say, you know what? I'm checked out not having this conversation. Last time this happened, it went south. Don't want to go there. Do you find yourself uh, in an area where you attack yourself, right? I notice this in a lot with allies that they'll often say, well, I think I'm stupid. I, I think I'm silly. I don't know things. I keep messing up. So notice when you're attacking yourself. And then the other is avoidance, which is also pair and pair with, uh, with withdrawn. Do you check out and say, you know what, not my problem, right? And as, as Terry highlighted, those principles are something that it's all of our problems, right? And so in the practice of leaning back and leaning in, this is a tool that you can use to really gauge where you're at. It's a tool that is great for when you are, if I can bluntly speak, pissed off, annoyed, um, potentially feeling emotional agitation, potentially feeling impatience and irritation. And so I'm gonna invite everybody to take a comfortable seat and we're gonna practice what it feels like to lean into um, the exercise of leaning back and leaning in. So to begin, if you're in a chair, you could also do this practice standing up. Today, I'm going to do it sitting down. So if you are in a chair, you can firmly place your feet on the earth. Your hands can come to the tops of your thighs. If you're standing, I wanna invite you to place your hand on your belly. Take a couple of deep breaths here in a way that feels most organic to you. And so you can breathe out of your nose, your mouth. I want you to notice how your breath is showing up in this moment. So I want to invite you to think of a time recently. And again, choose one that is accessible and safe for you to connect with. Could be something that, um, an experience that is currently happening for you. But think of a moment uh, where you have felt irritation, impatience, emotional agitation, anger,
It can be an event that recently happened or is in the past. Begin to notice where you carry, and maybe you already know this, anger, irritation, frustration, does it show up in your body? For me, it shows up right in my heart. I can feel my heart clenching when I'm angry or irritated. And I want you to invite you to check in with your body posture. By chance, are you leaning forward? Are the bellies in your, the muscles in your belly clenched? Do you notice tension between your eyebrows? Do you feel a faster pace of breath? Do you feel a rumination, which is cyclical thinking, showing up for you? Is your head down? Taking another deep breath, I want to invite you to lean back. Now, this is a great practice if you're in a chair to just lean back in a way that feels safe where you're not going to topple over. And if you're standing, potentially you want to go by a wall and just lean back. Think about how sometimes after difficult meetings or after difficult conversations, you find a wall, you're sitting down and you're just leaning back, right? As you think about what happened. So reenacting that, uh, that action of leaning back. Now, if your gaze is not already relaxed, I wanna invite you to soften your gaze, maybe fixating on a point on the ground. Imagine that you're looking behind your eyes, if that feels more accessible to you. And as you're looking behind your eyes, figuratively, inviting you to bring your gaze back forward and maintaining a soft gaze. And I want you to quickly or slowly scan with your gaze lowered what you're noticing. What do you see? How might you gently move around your eyes and head slowly as you scan the horizon? Continuing to do this for four more breath cycles. Next, I wanna invite you to notice any changes, any small mood shifts. You're still thinking about the thing that upset you or irritated you. Is it still there lingering, but it was a 10 and now it's a four? Do you still wanna react? Do you still wanna fix that thing that made you irritated or angry? Or can you pass the urge? I invite you now to gently open your eyes if they're not already there. Maybe fixating one, on one point in your room. 
You have now learned how to lean back and choose what you lean into. This tool is extremely useful when having conversations around allyship, as allyship can bring up and practice of solidarity and figuring it out can bring up a lot of emotions. Sometimes those emotions get labeled as guilt, white fragility, cis fragility. There's like a number of different terms. And so how can we acknowledge our own triggers? How can we slow down so that we are reacting from a place of centeredness and groundness and being able to speak our truth? What do you really wanna lean into when it comes to allyship? What is important? And how can we be in solidarity? Knowing that I may not know how I trespass on your sacred territory, but that we can move away from blaming, shaming, right? And stay in resolution with one another. So I'll hand it back to Allison. And some Thank you, Yami. Welcome. I'm going to um, go back to a question here that's in the chat, and I'd love to hear your perspective. I'd also love to hear Terry's perspective on how you would approach a question like this. These days, when I see a Black person in the subway or on the bus, I often thought of how their lives could be much harder than I. What's wrong with this line of thinking? That's the question. My question on top of that is, is there something wrong with that line of question? Let's, um, I'd love to hear both of your perspectives. Can you share the question one more time? Cause it went in and out. Yes. Yeah. Um, these days, when I see a Black person in the subway or on the bus, I often thought of how their lives could be much harder than mine. What's wrong with this line of thinking? <laughs> there is not a problem in being able to kind of identify um, that there may be an issue, but this is where the phrase comes in bias, be it implicit or um, uh, implicit, implicit or explicit, I can't remember, but we're talking about a bias here. So you believe or you perceive, be it from the media, be it what it has been put out there in society, that this Black person um, is at a disadvantage and not really knowing who the um, you know who the person is, and so what happens is you have already like passed a judgment, not getting to know who that person you know who that person is. Now you might say, you know what, I don't know if um, I'm at Pape Station, like they're just there. Is Pape still around? Because I remember that being a station. Okay, um, I, I'm just at Pape Station, and I'm just seeing this person. So I would say there there's no guilt and there's no shame in um, in in perceiving based off of your the information or your prior knowledge or your you know um that this person is at a disadvantage right the problem becomes is when you engage or interact with a marginalized group with pity and that's where it your your position as being an ally is to not take away from that person instead it is to give them an opportunity to provide the platform so that this person and the struggles that has been um, uh, poured on to that person, right? Because when you're born, you're blessed, right? But then society and the people around you and be your community. And for some, some people, their own homes, pour on the oppression and it becomes this burden that they carry. Don't allow your pity to be another burden for that person to carry. Instead, find ways to be able to support 
it may not be that individual because now by this point, all this talking I'm doing, the trainers already passed by. But how can you support? <laughs> how can you support somebody else, right? Um, but yeah, avoid the guilt and avoid uh, avoid the pity. Well, I, the way I would approach um, a question like this is. I think the discussion of allyship is exciting to me because not that it's a relatively new one, but I think more people are engaged in how to become a good ally. And I think one of the things you can give yourself is a little bit of grace in understanding that we are all figuring out the best ways of being an ally. But what I would definitely agree with, uh, with Terry, is that your approach shouldn't come from a place of pity, but rather empowerment. It's very nice that you notice that somebody was different from you and that um, if there is an interaction, you might consider that. Um, and I think that is like the right first step. And I think another step is just giving yourself like the pat on the back of like, okay, maybe that's something I wouldn't have recognized before. And if given the opportunity to help that person, what resources do I have within my toolbox to help them in the most effective way that I can? And if I don't get it perfectly right, then I can still go back in and be an ally again the next day and the day after that. I think the most important idea around allyship right now is that we are all figuring out how to do it effectively. And even I, I'm not going to get it right all the time, right? We're not gonna get it right all the time, but the idea is that you have the right intentions to move forward and where we are not doing it correctly, we are taking the time to step back, educate ourselves and figure out how we can do it in a more effective way. And I think we have about reached time here. Uh, Yami, do you have anything to add? I think uh, we lost you, your mic's not on there. I think uh, you both all, you both said uh, it eloquently, the only thing that I will offer is to ask yourself, why am I thinking this? Where did I learn this? What are the snap judgments that I'm making in this moment? Right, the only thing I had. Beautiful, thank you. Well, thank everyone for coming today. We hope that this session was helpful to you. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities for you to leave feedback on these programs because we really want to hear from you what you want to understand, different ways of how we can approach this. We want to be a resource and a helpful one to you so that we can all figure out how to be better allies and human beings. So I'm gonna pass it over to Natasha to say our goodbyes. Thank you, everyone. Oh, I'm seeing all the thank yous, very informative. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Allison, and to Yami, and to Terry. Again, a huge thank you on behalf of the ARCDO office and the UFT community for leading us through a very important uh, session and really trying to move the needle forward on this conversation of allyship. And you really gave us some important tips and food for thought that I know all of us can sort of implement in our personal and our professional lives as the new semester begins uh, here at UFT. Just wanted to make mention to folks that there are some upcoming events from the Anti-Racism and Cultural Diversity Office, specifically for Black History Month in the month of February with a symposium and film screening. As well, we have our upcoming conference for International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination as well. Uh, feel free to check our website out for more information about these events. As well, in the chat function, you may have seen or received a link to a feedback form um, just to provide some uh, thoughts or any sort of feedback on today's session. We really Really appreciate hearing from you. And first and foremost, and finally, again, thank you to Allison and her team. Thank you to the folks on the back end from ARCDO, my colleagues, again, for a wonderful session. I hope you all have a great rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. everyone. Thanks for coming. Family. Family. <laughs>
Eita. <risos> oh, guys. That is from the Yes, that is my daughter. I'm speaking to her. 